behalf of the Saxion Lectorate, International Water Technology, and welcome on behalf of Studium Generale. This webinar is of course related to the Sustainable Development Goals Charter that was signed by Saxion in 2018. Originally, this seminar would have been um, a normal conference as part of a so-called Aquaton on World Water Day, but Corona changed all those plans. And let's hope next year we will all be able to meet up in person again, but this year we will do it in this way by a webinar. My name is Richard Engelfried. I will be your moderator. We have three guests today. And if you would have a question for one of our guests, then you can simply text me or send me a WhatsApp message. My number is in the screen. Uh, what you can also do, that's another option, is just simply type your questions or remark in the chat of this uh, program, and then the moderator of the chat will send your question also to my phone. So if you see me playing with my phone, it means I'm reading your messages and I will ask them to one of the speakers. Um, afterwards, I will throw all the messages away, so your privacy is guaranteed. Um, someone says here, Richard, the chat is disabled. Um, thanks for the message. Uh, I hope we can fix that. Uh, if not, my number is constantly in the screen, so you can also write down my number and simply send me a WhatsApp text message uh, if you would have any questions. So I hope we can enable the chat, um, and otherwise just send me a message on my phone. Um, we will now start with our first guest. And, uh, oh, one thing I forgot. Um, als het voor je makkelijker is om in het Nederlands een vraag te stellen, dan mag dat. Stel hem gewoon in het Nederlands en dan vertaal ik hem naar het Engels. Um, that was in Dutch. I was telling people that if you have a question in Dutch, please do so and we'll translate it to English. And that's for any other language as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome for Melle Ikema, Arcadis Water Management. You can hear the round of applause. I hear we have more than 80 students watching you. Uh, Melle, welcome. Thank you. Um, could you introduce yourself in the camera? Hi, I'm uh, Melle Ikema. I work at Arcadis uh, as a consultant in water management. Uh, and I work mostly work on uh, rehabilitating natural areas in the Netherlands. Yeah, and uh, how does this go? Has someone just by surprise phoned you up or did you write something that, that apparently got some attention and they invited you over here? Um, well, actually, uh, 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 through a common uh, a person that me and uh, one of the organizers know, uh, we got talking. Ah, great. Uh, and I was speaking about uh, the water balance in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, so that was a topic that fit this uh, aquathon. Great. Or webinar. Yeah, this, this <laughs> webinar, or whatever you would like to call it. And we will start, of course, by your introduction, uh, which we also have some options of a Mentimeter. So there's also interaction involved here. So if you do have any questions, just simply type them to me. The first 10 minutes are for Melle, and then we will go on to all the questions. Good luck, Melle. All right. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, welcome. Um, I will give a short presentation on uh, water in the Netherlands, a uh, very big topic. We have a lot of water, um, but how do we distribute it across the Netherlands? Um, here you see I have a map, um, which if you look closely is the Netherlands, but then tilted. Uh, and on top of the screen, you can see the Alps um, and all the rivers that feed the water into the Netherlands. And I really like this map because it gives you an idea of what the Netherlands is really like uh, geographically. Uh, and how the water is uh, distributed into the Netherlands. Um, I'll go to my next slide, mm, if this works. Mm, it doesn't yet. Oh, it works now. Yes. All right. Um, well, uh, very roughly, this is the water balance. Uh, as you can see, uh, the water coming in, uh, this is in billion cubic meters per year, uh, but that doesn't really matter. It's about the relative sizes. Um, in an average year, um, there's about 27 million cubic or billion cubic meters of uh, rainfall. Uh, the Rhine attributes to 70, and other rivers to 11. Um, and the output is I don't know if you can see it's all the way in the bottom of the screen um, is as evaporation through plants um, used by us humans is three and 86 by rivers. Um, and what fascinates me about this water balance um, is, is that there's a lot of output in rivers. And we, the last couple of years, we had a couple of very dry summers, um, and people were starting to talk about water scarcity in the Netherlands. Netherlands. Um, but then I looked at this figure and I thought, like, why do we put so much water in the rivers or as output in the rivers while we have water scarcity? Well, the thing is, we need to push a lot of fresh water through rivers to keep saline water from the sea at bay, and also saline water in the ground at bay. Um, and this is to make sure that we can cultivate crops in the lower parts of the Netherlands. So in short answer, we need this fresh water in the rivers 
to be able to produce food in the Netherlands, or at least in the lower part. Right. Well, there are some changes in the water balance. Um, and many of the above are due to climate change. Uh, there are supply changes. Uh, first of all, more and longer dry spells, so longer periods without rain. Um, we have higher intensity r rainfall events, um, which at first, well, they don't really matter because they bring the same amount of water, but in a shorter amount of time. Uh, and this makes sure that we are not able to catch all the water and store it. Um, for instance, if you have a soil and there's an amount of water that it can uptake per minute and you go above that number, uh, then the water just becomes runoff and we lose it. Um, and then we have pollution of fresh water, uh, which is also uh, make sure that we cannot use certain freshwater bodies in the summer. Uh, think of blue-green algae. And then there's demand changes. The population in the Netherlands is growing, so we use more water. And we have sea level rise due to the ice caps melting. Uh, the sea level is going up, while at the same time uh, we have land subsidence in peat soils, where the land is going down. Uh, so up to three millimeters a year, um, we have a difference in the sea level going up. And that uh, means that we have more uh, salt water intrusion in the Netherlands. Um, and it's picking up speed. We don't know how much yet, but it's going faster. And there's a temperature increase, so there's more evaporation. Uh, so if I click back, you can see that the water used, the amount of water we need in the rivers, and the evaporations all go up. So the total out is a higher demand. Uh, and uh, the water in uh, becomes more difficult to control. So I have a first question for you. Um, and that's this one. And I would like to go to to call you all to go to Mentimeter and fill in the code that one of our colleagues will now show in the presentation. One moment, please. Yep. <laughs> so we will now go to Mentimeter. So uh, use one of your devices and you go to the website menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and you use the code 35 six six nine zero oh three so you go to menti.com and then you type in the code three five six six nine zero oh three i hope this is all in your screen so you go to the website menti.com you're using that code three five six six nine zero oh three and then you can answer this question for melle and um if you have answered the question then simply leave it there because some later on in melle's presentation we will do another question um so your question, how do you see the future of the Netherlands? And then you pick one of the answers. Yeah. And, and, and just to before, so we give people some time to fill this in, have you done this question before for other audiences? No. So we can compare a little bit, or is this a first-timer? This is a first-timer. This is a first-timer. Um, and what I find interesting is that, well, I want to know how uh, the younger generation, I also include myself in this younger yeah. generation, but well, maybe not, yeah. <laughs> for, for uh, purposes thinks, thinks about how we should save the Netherlands or how we should continue to be the Netherlands in the future with, well, the problems that I just... Yeah. I, uh, I just got a made. message from one of the students. Uh, define yourself as young. How old are you? <laughs> I'm 28. 28. That's still young, I think, for the student population. <laughs> and we see some answers coming in. Most of the votes so far for we should build higher flood protection and continue to match sea level rise. Yes. And we give you some more time to give your answer. Would that be your answer as well, Melle? Um, Partly. Partly. Um, I, I must admit that this is sort of a, a, a trick question because I think um, we should think in all directions to be able to cope with uh, the problems that are arising. Um, I think we should also let the sea reclaim parts of the Netherlands, which is a very tough decision, but uh, I think uh, some parts, especially uh, in the south, in South Holland and in North Holland, um, well, those parts are so far below sea level that the seawater will just continue through the groundwater and bubble up in these systems, in these polders, and we won't be able to keep it fresh water, uh, to keep it fresh there, and it will become saline. So you won't be able to grow crops there anyway, so why keep all the water out? All right, I think uh, I only have like five minutes left, so uh, I want to continue. But this is an interesting uh, uh, 
thought, because I do agree, we should try to keep uh, parts of the Netherlands uh, safe and uh, free from sea uh, from seawater. Um, but it's going to be very costly. And uh, well, the thing that I want you to think about uh, is that will we be able to afford these kinds of things? Um, and at what cost will you uh, stop doing uh, the things or to protect you from floods and just give up? All right. So if we give all the, uh, the sea uh, the space that it needs, the Netherlands will look like this in the picture on the right. Um, which is, uh, well, at least we'll have a lot more sea and a lot more islands, but well, I don't know if that's the thing we want. <laughs> uh, I'll try to go to the next slide. Oh, yes. Well, um, some colleagues of mine were asked by uh, some of the Dutch water boards in the higher parts of the Netherlands, so in the east, uh, to do an analysis of the dry summer in 2018. Um, well, this summer showed that especially drought causes more damage than waterlogging. So if you grow crops, drought is more devastating than more water. Um, and drought of this magnitude re was relatively new. Uh, we didn't really know how to handle it. Um, and as you can see in the picture to the right, uh, which was made by one of my colleagues, uh, it's just a very simple cartoon to show what happens. Uh, on the left is a normal summer, and you can see that the rainfall is about 370 millimeters. And on the right, you can see the summer of 2018, where the rainfall was almost halved. And also the evaporation was increased because it was very warm summer. Um, and this combination uh, made it so that there was almost no water available for drinking water. Uh, there was no groundwater refill in the summer, which is very important. Uh, there was no water for crops. Um, so. Yeah, this is kind of scary, and we don't want to have this to happen very often. Um, but it will occur more often because of the factors in climate change. Um, and drought affects all aspects of water management. So everyone, every institution needs to work together to solve these kinds of problems. Um, so I have another question for you, uh, and I'll show it to you first. Um, oh, can you wait a, can you wait a second? <laughs> um, you are a policymaker in the Netherlands. And there's a huge drought, like the summer of 2018. And I want you to prioritize these points that I filled in here in order of importance. So you rank number one as the most important to you, and then the other ones follow underneath. Yeah. So once more, you go to the same website, menti.com, to prioritize these nine options. And number one means your first most important option, and number nine is the less important, uh, the least important. So go to menti.com again, and then we ask you this question. So you are, let's say, a prime minister of the Netherlands, let's ministry say. of environment, maybe a minister of water affairs, and you can prioritize. So you go to the same website again, menti. I hope you still have it open, and now you go to the same question, and you prioritize these nine. Is this also then afterwards a trick question or? Um, no, this no. is not a trick question. I'm just interested in uh, how people view uh, the importance of these different aspects in yeah. the Netherlands. Yeah. And later on, I'll show how, uh, well, actually the Netherlands has decreed uh, the importance of these things. Very well. And, and while we are busy, uh, I can maybe ask you also some questions from the audience. Uh, one person, Bauke de Vries, he says uh, other solutions Changes in land use, no more intensive farming in low-lying peatland, uh, saline agriculture, etc. Uh, what about those other solutions? Oh, those are very good solutions, um, especially if you combine that with uh, giving up parts of the Netherlands in these polders uh, and you let salt water in and you get these uh, saline estuary estuaria. Yeah. Um, those can be used to grow sea lettuce or algae yeah. um, or even cultivate prawns. Um, and it would be a complete shift from, well, growing uh, grass for cows yeah. and then growing something sort of in the sea. Um, but I think it's possible, but uh, it's something that we have to start thinking about now because I think so some of these changes might already occur in 20, 30, maybe 40 years. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, very good question. 
Good question, and thanks for that. And also, our apologies. I hear from some people they have some problems with the screen. I hope you can fix it by enlarging your screen yourself. Uh, if not, then uh, I'm, I'm not a digital expert, so I hope you can fix it. But I hear some people have some issues with the screen. Um, we see some outcomes coming in. Yes. Seven people have already done that. Thank you for that. Oh, nine already. I nine see. already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're coming in now. And uh, you can give your conclusion on what you see. Yeah. So, um, I'll start right now. Uh, I see first drinking water supply. Of course, very important. Uh, we all want drinking water. I'll take a little sip right now. Um, and I think for everyone, it's the most, it's, well, it's the most important daily thing you, s you do with water. Um, and then afterwards, I see agricultural crops that can be saved from total devastation by just a little water. Also very important. Um, the stability of dikes and other flood defenses. Um, most people don't think about this when they hear drought, but clay needs some water to remain stable. stable. Uh, so we need sometimes need to sprinkle uh, dikes with water in order to keep them uh, stable. Um, natural areas that can recuperate. Um, well, these natural areas, they can sort of, over a length of a couple of years, they can restore themselves. Um, and then afterwards we see natural habitats that will see receive irrevocable damage. Um, so that will be destroyed by drought, uh, energy supply, soil subsidence, industries, and freshwater fisheries. Well, it's quite close, but not no cigar. <laughs> um, can we go back to my slides? And then I'll show you uh, what we uh, now have in place in the Netherlands in terms of uh, this prioritization. Right. So here we see four categories. Um, the first one is the most important, highest priority. Uh, natural habitats that, receive, that will receive irrevocable damage are of highest importance in the Netherlands. Uh, along with soil subsidence, stability of dikes and other flood defenses. Um, and these will, uh, are the highest priority because, well, these natural habitats, if they are destroyed, they can never be repaired or they have to be completely redone. Um, the same in peat soils. If the water goes out of these peat soils and the peat, uh, well, oxidizes, uh, because there's no water in, in it anymore, it just disappears. So you cannot put it back. Um, and stability of dikes and flood defenses is, of course, also very important. So we don't want the Netherlands flooding uh, and a lot of people dying because of it. Uh, the second highest priority is energy supply and drinking water supply. Drinking water supply is not as important as the other or, or category one uh, because we can import drinking water. We can just buy bottled water. It's going to be expensive, but well, you're not going to die. That's, that's the, the idea behind it. And then the category three and four are lower priorities, agricultural crops that can be saved from devastation. Um, and then we have industry, natural areas that can recuperate, and freshwater fisheries. Um, these are of lower importance um, because they can, over the course of a couple of years, they can uh, restore themselves. Um, but it's interesting to think about how the Dutch government thinks about your priorities in water. Uh, and then my last slide is um, what we can do uh, as the Netherlands and also what you can do. Um, and I think both are important. Um, I think the Dutch government should set an example and is very, uh, uh, how do you say that, is very much in control of the Netherlands and how we do things. Uh, so without the government being able uh, to steer uh, us against climate change, um, or in this case, uh, drought management, um, we won't be able to do it just by ourselves. So what should the Netherlands do? We should increase water retention. We should do drought control also outside dry spells. So for instance, increase the level uh, or the water level in the Isomere. Uh, so we have more drinking water supply. Uh, the de development of water conservation in spring and summer. Uh, standard for use of water with blue-green algae, so we can also use these polluted waters uh, for things that we are not allowed to use them for now. Um, and then, 
of course, some knowledge sharing, um, continued development of soil moisture monitoring, and then even more drastic, drastic options like, uh, well, giving parts of the Netherlands back to the sea. And then one more thing for uh, what you can do, uh, if you want to have a little bit of an impact, is eat less meat and dairy. Uh, it's very simple, uh, but hard for a lot of people. Uh, I sometimes struggle with it too. Uh, but as you can see, uh, just a piece of meat costs about two, uh, 2,400 liters of water to produce, and some fruit or vegetables about 70 or 80. Thank you very much, Mela Ikema. Uh, and we can, uh, some people asked that, can we share the, the slides? Yes, if people you want can to share have them. them. Yes. Uh, and of course, another question was, which part of the Netherlands should we first give back to the water? Ah, that's a very difficult question. Um, but I think we should start with uh, the lowest parts of the Netherlands. Ah, um, let's sink um, Amsterdam. Uh, yeah, for instance. But I think that's, that's going to be hard because yeah. there's a lot of people living there. Exactly. So we should start with the polders that don't have a lot of housing. Um, for instance, the area that I grew up in uh, around Gouda, uh, is very low. It's minus yeah. eight meters below sea level, and these polders. Yeah, um, I saw some calculations on uh, the production that they had there. Yeah. Um, that actually the the production that you have as agriculture uh, brings in less money that we than that we now need to keep these polders dry. Yep. So it's a weird uh, sort of a weird thing that we have going on there. Thank you very much, and that's also the app question I got from one of the students saying thank you very much, Mella. And we switch now to our next guest, which is Maarten Veerman. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Maarten Veerman, welcome. Thank you. Um, let's start also in the camera with your introduction. Oh, is something wrong? No, no, everything <laughs> is okay. I was just talking to one of the technicians here. Um, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Maarten Veerman. I work for Witt van Bos at the building department. Um, and apart from a lot of other projects I do, I'm the project leader of the Dutch Expo Pavilion in Dubai. Yeah, because that's of course what we're going to talk about. You Indeed. have some images here as well, but always interesting to start with the very beginning. I know maybe you know the, the Greek philosopher Archimedes who was laying in his <laughs> bath and then he had a eureka moment running uh, through the streets naked. Uh, how does this start? Well, uh <laughs> Now I must say I was not present at this Eureka moment. No, but um, I think that the Eure Eureka moment came uh, um, because of the fact that, uh, um, well, the, the government of the of the Netherlands um, uh, they asked companies in the Netherlands to come up with a plan for a pavilion in uh, in Dubai, mm -hmm. uh, and we teamed up with V8 um, Architects and uh, Cosman de Jong, and later with Expo Mobilia, who is a contra uh, the, the contractor of the pavilion, and we. Well, we developed a story about the uh, about the Dutch Pavilion in Dubai, uh, in line with the overall concept of uh, Dutch Dubai, which is uh, uniting energy, water, and food. Yeah. And could you stand a little bit close to the microphone? Yeah. Yep. And and the the fact that it <coughs> was uh, a zero CO2 <coughs> footprint was that a demand or was that your idea? Um, well, it was partly a demand. Um, the demands for circularity were quite strict. Uh, the demands for s uh, sustainability are also quite strict. Um, and of course, the fact that it's an exposition, it's an expo, we really want to show off, so to say. Yeah. So we really want to, to show wh what we're capable of and, uh, uh, and uh, what we're capable of as, as, as a company, but also as, uh, as the Netherlands. Yeah. And, and then you, you got a green light to say, Then we got on, a green go light, yeah, that yeah. We, we got a green light uh, based, on, um, based on this uh, uh, concept that we had to really create a, a machine-like building. Um, and this machine-like building is, yeah, it's processing humans, so to say. So a lot of humans uh, co come by, watch the show. Um, but we're really uniting energy, water, and food in the sense that um, we have an, a, a, a food mountain s in, the, in the very heart of the pavilion. Um, and inside this food mountain, the main show is taking place. And inside this mountain, we grow mushrooms. So we have a very humid climate inside this food mountain. So we have a very hum humid climate also in, in, a, in, in, a, in the middle in of the middle of a desert, desert yeah. indeed. How yeah. hard is that to build? Uh, it's, it's, it turned out to be quite hard <laughs> indeed. <laughs> um, uh, and, and then one of the other most, w w one other very important aspect is, is actually the fact that, that this building will be there for six months um, and then it should be demolished. Uh, and normally we work uh, on projects with buildings with lifespans of over 50 years. 
Um, so it's it's quite a unique project in in the sense that you, that, that it's also really hard for us as as engineers to to work um, on our autopilot, so to say. Mm -hmm. It's really you cannot work on your autopilot. So what we did is we we designed a building with with, with techniques that we're that we see very often in the Netherlands uh, in civil engineering structures using sheet piles, using uh, using large steel tubes. Mm -hmm. Um, and we know for a fact that these materials are actually uh, reused eight to 12 times uh, in, in, in normal situations. Um, so we use this civil engineering techniques in, in, a, in a building. And um, for us as a civil engineering company, this was actually quite normal, so to say. Yeah. Um, but for but others. In for others, and especially in, in Dubai, it turned out to be an insane. <laughs> how, 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 what did people say when, when uh, they, you know, you, you talk with people, you meet people, they look at you, they ask you yeah, questions. Yeah, what, so, what the, was so the, the very first thing when, we, when we presented get? the project in Dubai was, the, was that, uh, that, that we said, okay, so this structure is really the way we, we build civil engineering structures in the Netherlands, eh, like uh, underground uh, metro stations in Amsterdam. You, you can see these sheet piles and these tubes. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the immediate reaction was, okay, but but this is this is not a metro station, this is a building, and and we then we said, <laughs> okay, but the calculations are are almost the same, yeah, but this is a building, and it turned out to be really hard to 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 get this mind shift going on in um, in the Dubai context. So the the thing was is we designed a building which which was really a machine with tex techniques that were really uh, showing what we we're capable of, and then we. Then we had to make sure that, that that we could actually build it, yeah, uh, in in accordance with legislation, in accordance with um, yeah l uh, rules and um, and and things we were not aware of uh, during the during the start of the of the project. Yeah, um, is it working? Yeah, it's working. Yeah, what and for example, for example, the, the 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 main thing of this of this building is actually the the fact that it's really a, this this machine, uh, which is. Um, uh, with this food mountain in the in the very heart of the of the of the building, which is not only producing food, which w which was actually meant to be the main um, uh, cooling installation of the whole of the whole pavilion, um, and we performed calculations um, in the in the very first phases of the project, showing that this is actually a, a, a thing that is possible to do. Um, uh, but for example, then we hit the the legislation in Dubai. Uh, really demanding that there was this active cooling system that had to be installed in public pla uh, public places, while this is actually based on a passive cooling system, uh, with um, uh, yeah, with, with 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 water moisture cooling the, the the inner part of the cone and then spreading out to the whole pavilion. Um, so we had to adjust our design, we had to adjust our uh, installation design, still staying as close as possible to the original concept, of course, because that's what we won the uh, the one won the pavilion for, or won the, won the project for. And um, uh, while trying to make sure that was actually, um, that we were able to, to, to reach a, a level of, of permitting in, in Dubai. Yeah. Um, so yeah, really hard. So in, in essentially the, 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 main, the main story, yeah, the, the reigning story is the heart of the, of the, of the pavilion, this inner cone where the, where the main presentation of the Netherlands is taking place will still look like this. Um, um, it, but but the system as a whole is is becoming a little bit more an active like system and not 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 necessarily a, a passive uh, passive system anymore. Um, yeah, and then Corona came in, <laughs> uh, so we were actually uh, it was actually going quite well. Um, uh, we were actually one of the pavilions really ahead of uh, of schedule, um, and then yeah, Corona changed everything. Changed the world and also yeah. uh, um, changed the uh, uh, yeah the expo because you still don't know if you're because it's still there or is it everyone still uh, yeah, there? Yeah, it's, uh, it's still it's, it's still there. Yeah, it's still this there. is what it looks like now. Yeah, yeah, and and of course there's nothing to be said about the future. You don't know when you're going back if you're going back. Well, the um, the opening of the expo is now planned at uh, October 2021. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens. That's so uh, the the plan is actually the con the construction is now on hold, yeah. And uh, the 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 plan is to continue construction in February again. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's really uh, yeah it's it's an interesting situation. Yeah. It it turned out to be it it turned out to be really tricky very quickly because yeah. a lot of materials coming in. Uh, 
a lot of pavilions had uh, problems with materials. We, we hope for the best, of course, for you. Uh, but also, yeah, um, what you've done already, I think you must have learned a lot from it. And also, if you make a connection to the presentation of Melle, uh, stating all the issues we have with waters, can you tell us, are there any yeah. lessons learned from what you've done here that you think we can learn from in the Netherlands? Are there things, techniques you use there that you say, well, we can use that here? Well, um, uh, what what we've really noticed is is, uh, is the differences in the, the differences in in techniques being used between the Netherlands and Dubai. For example, in Dubai, they have a, 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 se a separate sanitation system with 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 sep separate separate tubes for a different kind of uh, um, uh, sewage. Mm -hmm. um, and this was really a, a mind shift, also 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 for us, I'd say. Um, one of the th key things what they do is uh, that they store the inside the pavilion actually we have a, a storage for drinking water yeah. um, which is um, w um, yeah a storage that should hold uh, one day of drinking water for the whole pavilion and it needs to be <laughs> emptied every day so this is also a little bit bit strange but this, this is really something that we're not aware of in the Netherlands in the Netherlands it's really like okay you know for a fact that this water will come in eh? yeah and um, uh, uh, that, that's that's the main difference in uh, in, in Dubai. Uh, and even when we said, look, we have this this system that we think will be able to uh, will be we will be able to make make water from the air. Mm -hmm. It was really a no go to 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 move this storage out of the pavilion. It was this is the legislation. These yeah. are the rules that you need to comply with. Yeah. Um, so really, really strict, really strict in, in following the rules. Yeah. yeah. But luckily in the Netherlands we have different legislation. We have different rules. Um, yeah. I th I yes. And I think that um, one of the things that I really hoped with this project was that we would be would, would have a little bit more freedom in 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 uh, installing systems um, with 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 a hi very high innovative uh, yeah. of a high innovative level. And really trying things, you know, uh, there there are yeah. things that we w really want to try. So we would love to have tried this yeah. passive cooling but system. Uh, l l let's say um, that uh, you know Corona is over, and um, but uh, our prime minister here asks you here to make improvements uh, with your knowledge that you have. What what do you think is the best thing to change now in the Netherlands? Also based on your experience in Dubai. Um, uh, well, one of the key things with this pavilion is the is the fact that we uh, designed this building to be demolished. So we always said that this project is over for us uh, when the um, when the building is gone. Yeah, it, it it's yeah. over when when the building is fully demolished. And this uh, and and, the, uh, and what we learned by doing that, um, we can really use in uh, in other projects as well. Um, although we must always keep in mind that the lifespan of buildings is really really different and yeah. you know the, the thing is that this building is so you unique might have in learned terms a lot of also we, we're looking for uh, also a way into making products and and maybe houses buildings more circular this might be one of the uh, solutions you have in the Netherlands or is that too easy to talk no about? that's too easy it's it's way more no, difficult. That's, uh, no that, that's too easy that's ba basically because of the fact that this building is so unique in terms yeah. of the in terms of the climate it's in in terms of the fun functionality it is it, it yeah. it's holding um, in terms of um, in terms of the lifespan, I mean six uh, six months lifespan for a building is really that yeah, yeah. that's something you will I will I, I I think I will never have a project again with that short lifespan. Thanks for that. There's a question from the audience, and thanks for that. Uh, someone says, "What's so unique about the Dutch circular system between water, uh, food, and energy?" I don't know if if Martin has said anything about it, but. Um, have you thought about or uh, were you surprised it's a question in dutch so i have to translate are you surprised by the way they use water in the locals in in dubai um, is water shortage an issue there the same as it is in the netherlands as we saw presented by mella um it's not necessarily a problem in in a sense that we that there was never the discussion about about water shortage or, or, or things like that. The the only thing is that we had to install this this this, this yeah, storage basin, so to say, for for uh, potable yeah. water. Um, but uh, if you look at the, at do they at have the same level of awareness as we have? You think? Or maybe even yeah, more? they do because uh, it, yeah, uh, surely in case in, in terms of water usage and uh, and and surely in terms of. Uh, 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 cooling systems and things like that. Yep. Although um, the, the cooling systems that we proposed were more, I think, were a little bit more in innovative than they would really wanted mm -hmm. it to be. Yeah. 
And yeah. then one other and uh, final aspect about different cultures. Uh, you already told us about some r regulations that you have, but did you also see some parts in, the, in let's say, the cultural aspects? There were some of cultural clashes. What was the Definitely. What was the biggest one? The biggest one is, um, and that's uh, that's actually, I think that we th that we understood that too too late, is the fact that um, if people make a mistake in Dubai, yeah, they they are expelled from the country. Um, so everybody is really keen on following the rules, yeah, following the check boxes, and that is also one of the main reasons why it was really hard to to, to say, look, we have this civil engineering type of of, of uh, pavilion, and uh, no, we need to make it in in line with building regulations, and uh, and yeah. we said, look, it's an expo, it's only six months, no, no, it needs to be calculated in terms of uh, 50 years. Uh, with regards to the structure and also 50 years with regards to earthquakes and things like that. And, you know, it be because it was really following the checkboxes. And this is something that we, that was really a, the main cultural difference. Yeah. yeah. And a final question from Melle. Uh, he asked, what would you like to see in the future of building sustainability in the Netherlands with this pavilion in mind? Good question. Um, <laughs> I, I would, I, it's not necessarily with this pavilion in mind. Well, the thing with this pavilion is that um, uh, uh, it, it's super modular. Eh? So all these sheet piles are, I mean, we have like one or two types of sheet piles uh, and we have two types of tubes. So it's super, super modular. And I think this modularity is what we really uh, uh, need to focus on in, in terms of uh, building uh, buildings and um, in, in building innovation. I think that this is already uh, starting to happen and it's, it, it's, it's a process that you see happening in both housing and uh, utility buildings. Uh, and what will happen because of that is that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the work will uh, transfer to, um, to factories. Yep. So uh, the, 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 the there will be a higher level of uh, uh, prefabrication, so to say. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Maarten Veerman. And I would like to ask forward uh, Melle for one second because you've got another question from the audience. And then I'll switch to our uh, third guest, Ab Verhegge, who is listening with us. But right. a, a question for you came in from Bauke de Vries. He says, a quite interesting statement of Melle at the end of his presentation. The cost of keeping the polders dry are higher than the benefits of the agriculture in these polders. Is it possible to get more details on the background of this statement? Uh, yes, it is, definitely. Um, I don't have any, I don't know any uh, sources by heart, uh, okay. but I can, uh, I can try and find them and uh, send them to uh, the organization. Yeah, great. Yes. So uh, Bauke, if you can provide us with your email address, uh, I can get you in touch. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mella. And then I would like to introduce you on the screen here for me, uh, listening with us um, is Ab Verhegge. I hope Ab, can you hear us? Yes, I hope you can hear me too. Yes, we can. And thank you very much uh, also for being with us. And uh, we just heard from Marta a, a great example. And I think you have another great example. And let me introduce it. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you are a non-technology person. Um, you are also not a scientist, but you do have a patent. Uh, you have a technological patent that, that's quite special. And you're an artist. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and, and could you have so, ever imagined that this was the case in your life? Never. Never? I, uh, from my origin, uh, I'm an, uh, an uh, architectural designer who started to film in the Arctic. And uh, by the Arctic, I came to the deserts and then that way to, uh, to, uh, to the subject of water. And uh, I made. Uh, uh, I left uh, and worked for many years in the, in the, the northern regions, and I saw that uh, the climate was changing very rapidly. So we installed uh, some sculptures on a drifting iceberg to show the, the audience worldwide the speed of climate change. Yeah. And um, instead of uh, eight years uh, drifting my sculptures through the Arctic. Uh, they collapsed within four months because it was 40 degrees Celsius warmer than, uh, than usual. And then I came up with the idea uh, when the, 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 the speed of climate change comes to, our, to the lower altitudes, like here, then we are in a deep uh, shed. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I saw by myself, we have to find solutions. And uh, immediately, so 
what if I would uh, build uh, a completely autonomously running uh, glacier in the middle of a hot desert? If I would succeed, then I could show the whole world that we also have we have solutions. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, working at that uh, project uh, and five years ago, I got from the most uh, strange uh, parts in the whole world. I got uh, questions: Can you can you uh, uh, switch your focus for making ice to water? And um, I got these questions, for example, from uh, uh, the Amazonas regions that that I never could could think that that uh, uh, they were affected by by drought. But so more and more, so we changed, I changed my, my focus from uh, uh, ice to water. And, uh, and that way uh, I came up with, uh, we came up with a new idea of new technology of uh, harvesting water from air. Yeah. And, uh, and it's uh, uh, rewarded with, uh, with a patent. Yeah. And, and can you explain uh, also maybe to people who are non-technical, what, what is in the patent? What is so special about this technology? Uh, I, I, it's it's very uh, 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 it's it's too much technique, but uh, I will explain how the machines run. Yeah. My the, the principles of the machines. That the idea is uh, to use as less as possible energy uh, to uh, to run a cooling device, and the cooling device cools water. The water falls down and slurps uh, air into the waterfall, the, the moisture in the air comes below the dew point, And so you get a growing waterfall principle. So when the water hits the bottom, the, the quantity is more than when you started at the top. So it's very simple. <laughs> if you talk it like this, it, it seems very simple. You also brought some slides. And because now everyone sees your face, and so we will uh, change your face for your slides. Um, yeah, so that's yeah. better. <laughs> <laughs> well, that depends on your, uh, your preferences. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we, we see some slides. You, you, you brought some with them. Uh, which one do you think is most appropriate to, to just give us a, an, a visual image of what you just explained us? Because we see some different yeah, slides we, here. I already, um, I, I just saw a, a slide that was. Uh, uh, that is coming from uh, uh, Mali, and in uh, Mali we uh, we uh, tested with all the state of the art technology yeah. that you can buy yeah. in the market. We we see you here we stand, standing in the desert. Yeah, this is uh, uh, this is the military camp compound in uh, Gao, Mali. Yeah, and uh, let, let, let's we take... uh, tested it. Yeah. Yeah, let, let, let's explain also what, what you're doing now with the military. Why are you involved with them? Because the, the military is not only uh, making war, but uh, they also uh, are very keen on uh, conflict prevention. And especially in, the, in these uh, regions, uh, the, the sub saharan regions, there's a lot of tension, and most of it is related to water. So in... Uh, we uh, I tried to uh, to uh, we we bought the state of the art technology that is on the market. Yeah. We tested it there. It was successful. It's completely uh, uh, self-supporting. Uh, this the all the power is produced by solar energy. The energy is converted to uh, uh, to to water in that in these machines. But yeah. during the process, the water evaporated. So when we uh, when we came uh, back in the Netherlands, we decided uh, to design a new technology, and that was uh, what we uh, what we are working with right now. Yeah, and that's also quite a unique thing, I think, to realize also for the students. Eh? So it's it's one thing to have a patent, it's one thing to have a technology, but it's another thing to get it working and to put it in practice. And you also succeeded in that. Yeah, that's I think. In our uh, uh, in our setting, it was just all around. We uh, we invented, and later we, uh, we 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 were informed for maybe it's better guys to, to, to have a patent so you get it in, into the market. Because uh, we are now uh, talking uh, 
we are now building a couple of machines size a small refrigerator yeah. for a defense they produce between the 10 and 50 liters water uh, a day yeah and uh, uh, but to get us to a manufacturing company uh, they have to invest a lot of money to make uh, to, 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 to build machines that are uh, yeah, market ready it's a lot about so we are very happy that we yeah. even in that could take next steps even though we uh, yeah we have a, a problem now with uh, the corona and and we uh, the, the audience i hope they see some pictures uh, one of them is is showing that this can provide fresh water as well m in the middle of a desert and we saw some camels drinking yeah the 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 water that we produce is pure h2o so if you want to have, use it as drinking water you have to enrich it with minerals but uh, you also can uh, use the water for uh, uh, agriculture but also i did a project there is a summer slide in it we uh, produced uh, food inside uh, inside the close room last year. We uh, grew grains, yeah. so we could uh, mimic uh, uh, we could uh, mimic the the the, yeah, the, 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 the cycle of uh, day and night. Yeah, and, and, and all the water and up there, all the water we got from the ocean. That yeah, that's that picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. And and, and, and there is and a the question. The of this is. Yep. Yeah. What, what's the uniqueness? Uh, that we didn't use any water, uh, external water, yeah. for this project, what you see in your background. Yeah, because that, that's also the question. So we, huh? um, I think everyone yeah. agrees this is unique and it, it's, it's uh, maybe beyond our imagination. Um, someone says this looks like, oh, I hope everything is okay. Someone says this looks like the Holy Grail. But how can we upskill? In other words, how much fresh water can you produce? If we would really upskill this, if all the countries, if all the budget, let's say, would, would be unlimited, how much water can you produce with this system? In theory. Uh, I think the, uh, the water, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a scientist, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, our goal is to produce many, many machines, very cheap, available for everyone on this planet yeah. that's my goal everybody has the right to have safe and clean drinking water so uh, there's a suggestion up someone from the audience says is it able to buy a backpack of sun glacier uh, to buy at for example one of the big stores the decathlon or the bever sport you know one of those outdoor shops um do you think that uh, that's is that a good dream that's that's uh, a <laughs> that's that's the ultimate goal we already because building it big it's not a problem to yeah. make it small and compact that's the biggest problem and i'm now working for two years at a backpack that i can uh, bring on my back to the desert and that i can survive from my own that all the, my own drinking water yeah and and but uh, uh, what kind of expertise do you need for this dream if you say i want to make it small what kind of expertise are you looking for maybe we can help you out uh, yeah, but I'm I'm uh, uh, more a guy of uh, testing. Yeah. When something is wrong, I look what's wrong and immediately start something to to adapt or change or so the problems. It's not the 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 the, the, the technology that we use. Yeah. It's uh, uh, so new that you don't have any. We don't have uh, expertise that we compare to. Uh, uh, yeah. To, 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 or that we can make comparisons with other technologies. Okay. Okay. That's the problem. And, and someone also asked, um, uh, you, you just told us that you are in Europe with your equipment and where are you in Europe and why are you there? Um, I'm, I'm uh, uh, still in the, in the Netherlands. And uh, wh and whereabouts? Uh, you, you don't have to give us your ad address, but what, what city are you? <laughs> uh, we are two address, there's three addresses. <laughs> In the Ridderkerk, uh, in Schiedam, and uh, in The Hague. Okay, okay. And, and someone specifically um, gives their email address and they say, Up, are you interested to explore combining it with a sewageless sanitation concept? And that's from Ruben Timmers. Of course. Of course. Yeah, it's a, of so course. So I'll, uh, I'll give Ruben uh, your, uh, your contact information. Yeah. Is that okay? Everybody, and they also can have a look at the sandglacier.com. That's ah, uh, there the, you go. The, the website. Yeah. yeah, so you can 
send me a message and uh, I always give you an answer. That's great. So uh, I think this is Ruben Tibbers. Please do so. Uh, also, I would like, uh, I'm, I'm very curious, Melle, um, you told us about the problems we have in the Netherlands. You told us about uh, some solutions that you can do by uh, eating less meat, etc. Uh, but this, of course, is a, is a technological breakthrough, as I hear it, but you are far more expertise than I am. <laughs> what do you think of this? Yeah, it's, it's great. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know uh, this existed, um, so I'm uh, pleasantly surprised. It looks uh, awesome, um, and I really uh, would like to uh, see it uh, for myself and test it as well. It looks it looks great, um, but I, I and Thank I really you. think this could could be a, a game changer in terms of uh, bringing water to everyone. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I still I think uh, water should be uh, is is still a precious good. So uh, water conservation is still important, and I think we should do uh, all the things uh, to save water yep. and to uh, bring the world in balance uh, and. I think this, that's this correct what you uh, yeah. it's correct what you tell it's it's not only the the drinking water problem but it's also the environment everything so it's uh, uh and i liked your presentation it was uh, <laughs> very inspiring thank you very and and someone maybe it's a little joke says up uh, is your next project to think of something for uh too much water uh i think uh and uh the problem we have right now is our drought or too much. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the, the, there is not, uh, it's, it's one or the other. Yeah. I think that's already, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's already the, the answer of the question. And uh, finally, of course, Marte, can I also ask you? No, Marte. Oh. Yeah, Marte, because of I course. I said, uh, hi, Marte. Yes. Oh, yeah. So you can meet up. Um, <laughs> And up, uh, you've heard also the very inspiring story of Martin uh, in Dubai. Um, and of course, I want yeah. to know the other way around. Martin, uh, were you inspired as well by this example? And what do you think of kind of potentials that we have here with, with, with this technology? Well, um, yeah, the Sun Glacier was part of the, of the, uh, of the pavilion um, from the almost very start. So Are you yeah, <laughs> we've met. Ah, OK, OK. <laughs> That was an easy so one. one of the, the the tricks we pull in producing water in uh, in yeah. the desert is uh, by uh, yeah by in, in installing sun glacier uh, systems. Yeah, great. Um, what, what potential do you see in this technology? Well, the can the, we the upscale this? The yeah, you can upscale it by producing more sun glaciers, of course. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, but this is really the technology that uh, you should uh, ask uh, up about. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Thanks we very are, much. We are more the in <laughs> integrators, I have to say. Very good, very good. Yeah. Thanks for that, Maarten. Uh, up, uh, this is a great yeah, solution. The, 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 yeah, the sun glacier technology will yeah. be uh, integrated in the, the design of the uh, of the Dutch pavilion and and for the World Expo in Dubai. Yeah. And there, it's an uh, it's a bit a different uh, technology. It's it's more adapted to uh, to uh, what all the uh, uh, the engineers designed. So it's integrated. It's a kind of an integration of the technology, and there we make a couple of hundreds of liters water a day. That's great, Up. And um, of course, for all the students, finally, uh, my last question for you. Do you have any advice for the students? Because you have achieved something, maybe even with a very strange or not very ordinary background. What would your advice be? Because I know there are students listening, watching. They might, might also have creative ideas, but they might also think, well, I don't know if it's going to work. What's your advice to them? Uh, I, my advice is always follow your heart. Uh, when, when I look to, to, to my trip from uh, 2010 until now, to, to, to have a machine, a working machine, not a concept anymore, that can be uh, uh, eventually mass produced in the world, it's, it's not a... It's not a road of success, but it's 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 a road of uh, only uh, 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 bad things that happen. Uh, but when you want something, you go for it, and you always find in your heart uh, some new uh, escapes to come to your target. So my uh, advice to the students is: follow your heart, and if you want to do something. Believe me, you always will succeed. As I succeeded as an artist uh, to build uh, a machine that extracts water from air. 
So it's uh, uh, <laughs> do it. If it can be as crazy as you have proven, then anything can be happening. That's the problem. In this world, nothing is crazy. Up. Thank you very much for your inspiration and your ideas. I'm sure a lot of students are applauding now. Um, and of course, as you know, you are all invited by Up and of course by the other speakers as well to contact them if you have your own ideas uh, and please share them together. Also, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for all your questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed this and later on we will share all the slides with you so you can look it all back. Um, I hope you have uh, a good webinar here and we hope to see you next time with Studium Generale. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.